Welcome to Quaker House. I'm Chuck Fager. Quaker House is mostly a peace organization, but we're also concerned with issues of justice and a very salient issue along that line these days around here has to do with justice for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people in our community and across the state, across the country. Last week, a sermon was preached in a Baptist church in Fayetteville, and in that sermon, the pastor focused especially on what he called God's plan and made it clear that as he understood it, gays, and lesbians, bisexuals, transgender people had no place in God's plan. And in fact, their very existence was a blot and a contradiction to God's plan. Well, we have a different understanding of God's plan. And there's been a lot of media controversy generated out of that sermon. In the days afterwards, the preacher kind of backtracked some. He edited the transcript of it and even issued a kind of a limited apology and has had extensive interviews with uh, various media outlets. In all that furor, though, there's been very limited opportunity for members of the LGBT community in and around Fayetteville to bear their own witness about what kind of impact that sort of speech and that sort of outlook has had on their lives and the lives of others that they know. So we decided at the Quaker House that we would invite some of these folks to come and bear their witness about this, and that's what we're going to do. We have six folks from around our community who are going to speak to you soon and briefly. I think you'll find some of them very vivid and even powerful. Before we do that, though, we're going to show a series of short clips from the original sermon. These don't really include the most notorious or famous ones that are most familiar, the ones about squashing like a cockroach, any signs of any sort of uh, gender variance on the part, particularly of young children. We're skipping those because they're so well known, and it turns out that there were several other clips that were, in our judgment, equally egregious and worth taking, paying attention to. So, after those clips, which may be difficult for some viewers, I just want you to know, and we're sorry about that, but we think it's important for background. We'll hear from six people, beginning with Reverend Catherine Royal, who's the co-pastor of a ministry that is especially welcoming to GLBT folks in and around Fayetteville, North Carolina. Can we roll those clips, please? Activist judges in other states have issued decisions redefining marriage to make it genderless, thus imposing same-sex marriage without people of those states being able to vote. By the way, let's just recognize that the very term same-sex marriage is a politically correct term in an effort to minimize the stigma that's associated with such unnatural and sinful behavior. So lesson number one, God gave you your gender. God gave you your gender. God gave it to you. God designed you to be a male. God designed you to be a female before you were even created. God knew you and ordained that you would be a male or you would be a female. And anytime you indicate gender dissatisfaction, you are a sinning toward God. Anytime. Anytime you look in the mirror and say, God, I wish, well, I, that has never happened in my entire life. I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't even finish that. I mean, I, that, that, that is beyond comprehension. Okay? Transgender operations are an affront to God. They are an affront to God. And yet we have evangelical churches, and we use that term extremely loose this morning, who in fact have people in their congregations that were born females and have now done whatever it takes to present themselves as males. That is an affront to God. Men ought to act like men and women ought to act like women. 
living out gender distinctions glorifies God. Did you get that? Let's go over it one more time. Number one, God made you. Number two, Christ died for you so you believe in Christ. And number three, you glorify God with every single thing you do. When that happens, those children help to fill and subdue the earth. They have dominion over every living thing, and they get married, and they have those amazing things called grandbabies. And those grandbabies get married, and they have more children. And that's God's plan. The children do. So if you're in mar and you're in marriage right now, stay married. First marriage, stay married. Second marriage, stay married. Stay married. Work it out. Figure it out. Fall on your knees every day and pray for grace. Repent. Seek the Lord. Work it out. Say, so what's the government's role? I'll tell you what the government's role is. Government should promote and define marriage as one man and one woman because that is the best union to produce children in the most natural, efficient, and beneficially productive means. You say, what about artificial insemination? Artificial insemination should be used only for those married couples that cannot get pregnant. It is not a means to have children outside of marriage. It is not a means to have children outside of marriage. I really don't want to deal with that dude. He's such a pain, but I would love to have a little baby. So I go to a donor center and I find anybody and allow them to... No! No! While it is true that artificial insemination can eliminate the need for the one flesh union, there is no replacement for father or mother in the home. No replacement. There is no replacement. Any of us that are raising children, we know. We know. I tell my son all the time, the only reason you're still alive is because your mom's here. <laughs> Should two dudes shacking up who will never, ever, ever produce a child... Should they get the same tax advantage that a husband and wife living together who have the propensity of producing children? Should they get the same tax benefit? And the answer is absolutely, positively not. Why? Because the union of a male and a woman is good for America, whereas the union of two dudes is not good for America. Gay and lesbians are not prohibited from loving each other. They're doing that already in the most sick and ungodly way. So here's my instructions to you. As your spiritual leader, according to Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 17, you are to obey what I tell you to do. And I'm telling you to vote early. You do not allow anything to take precedent over this this week. You make this your priority. You will stand accountable for God for the decisions you make. And if you decide, I've got too much going on this week to take the time to register and get over there to vote, that is S-I-N. Uh, absolutely. Um, I... <laughs> I heard a sermon like this for honestly the first time when I was 17 years old. I had known since I was about 14 that I wanted to go into the ministry and the church I grew up in did not speak about the issue of homosexuality, uh, being transgendered, nothing like that. So I didn't really know that there were Christians that took issue with this, that thought that the Bible taught against it. Um, I knew I was bisexual at the age of seven, although I didn't have a word for it until college. I never told anybody about it except for obviously the people that I was seeing throughout the years. What shook me was in college <clears throat> going to a sermon at a chapel service at my college, which 
was a whole heck of a lot like the sermon that was just preached over at Berean. And it shook me to my core. I knew God was calling me to be a pastor. I knew what I was supposed to do. <clears throat> but I honestly thought, well, if I'm going to hell for the fact that I'm attracted to men and attracted to women, I need to change that. So I jumped headlong into a very well-known ex-gay therapy group that they were promoting that day for about a year and a half. And honestly, there was a time in my life where after that experience, I wasn't wearing bracelets like I have right now on my wrist because of the fact that I like the messages on them. I was wearing them to cover the scars of self-injury that was promoted by this ex-gay therapy group and the scars from a very botched suicide attempt. And that's what I've seen going on since this sermon. I've talked to numerous youth uh, who are current and former members of this church who are members of the LGBT community who are desperately depressed right now. <coughs> Can you say a little bit about uh, how your own theological perspective differs from his and, and what you think the crucial points that we ought to understand are? One of the things that bothers me, honestly, the most with so many churches nowadays is I see this thing called, many people call proof texting, where somebody will lift a verse or a few words out of a point in the Bible and use it to promote whatever point that they're trying to make. They take it out of the context of the overall message of the Bible. <clears throat> that has been done throughout the years to condemn pretty much everybody who's different. It was used at one point to condemn interracial marriage. It was used at one point to promote slavery. It's now being used, as it has been for a while, against the GLBT community. People don't seem to realize <clears throat> the first Bible was not <coughs> written in English, in a society where we had concepts of sexual orientation, of what it meant to be attracted to one another, of what any of that was, and words like homosexual offender, words like transgendered, words like effeminate, that's not what the original translations were. That's not what the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Aramaic said. And what the real big error here is, is what's really condemned in the Bible is not what we're being told is condemned, but are things that exploit people, things that harm people, like pederasty, like rape, like gang rape in a couple of instances, and not anything having to do with the love and commitment between two people, regardless of their gender. Olivia, I have to say that when I uh, first saw you at Diversity of Church, I, uh, what surprised me was how much you wanted to be a Christian. Uh, and um, I, I wonder if, you want to ref if you'd be willing to reflect on that a little bit. What, what, you don't have to tell us your whole story, but a little something about uh, what you've been through and, and how come after that you're still interested in church, especially when you, after we heard that terrible stuff, at least what I thought was terrible stuff in there. Well, I had been to other churches, and then basically when they find out what you are, they basically don't want you there because they feel like you're an abomination. And um, just something came along where I met the people from Diversity and Faith, and they don't judge me for what's between my legs or, or any type of things like that. They look at me as a person, and I think that's how God views me, as a person. I don't think he cares about the outer side. He can, he can, he, I think he <coughs> is concerned with what's on the inside. And, um, and the thought about being born a man or a woman, it doesn't come down to that. To me, the doctor told me I had more certain chromosomes than I did, more female than I did male. And so I said, well, you know, and I knew this from when I was real young. And my parents knew I was different. My mother accepted it, but my father didn't. And so that kind of hurt me because you're supposed to be loved unconditionally by your parents. So I just said, well, I'll just, this is how I live. And 
as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, I don't feel like I'm doing anything wrong. I'm trying to be make myself happy in this life until the afterlife. And um, what is it? Do you find that's a benefit to you in uh, the diversity and faith congregation? Well, they they show love. They don't judge you. They they welcome you. They had a surprise birthday party for me, which mm -hmm. nobody's ever done. You know and they got to see my vulnerability because I cried. And normally I don't cry in front of people. I do it at home. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I go home now and I pray at night time, which I never did. You know, I stayed at home because I have a neighbor who's very hateful towards me. He, he kind of bullies me, but I don't let that get the best of me. And you know, he was a former sheriff. And he's supposed to protect you, not put you down. And so I just, I love going to do to the sermons on Sundays and I try to go to other events and stuff because I feel like me being like I am, if I can help somebody else, then that's good. That, that's what's good about it. If you had one kind of short message that you could deliver to <sighs> this pastor and the ones like him and do it in a safe way where you were safe, what, what, what would you like them to know. Well, I think that's why I didn't I don't I didn't go to churches until now is because I just don't understand how somebody who God's all about love. And when a preacher stands up and preaches about hate, I just I just don't understand that because that's not the way it's supposed to be. And I don't know what the outcome it is. I don't hate him. I forgive him. But I don't think that Maybe they'll do, replace him. That's not my for me to determine. But to me, I think his preacher's license should be revoked. Now, this is Wayne Riggins. He has the great distinction of uh, being a resident of Hillside Avenue, here where we are here, down the street side. Um, I gather you're a physician. I believe I've been told you're also a military veteran. Is that right? And um, you live here with your partner. Right. How long have you all been together? 20 years. Okay. Um, and a couple years ago, the legislature had a bill that they dealt with about uh, bullying, as I recall. And I believe you wrote a piece in the paper. Sure. Um, could you describe a little bit about what you wrote about and um, how that might relate to what we're dealing with today? Sure. First, I'd like to say, as a preface, I, I think in times like this that uh, it's easy to say things that add more heat than light. Yeah. And uh, so I try in public discourse not to do that. So to that end, I'd like to say that if I, as a physician, could prescribe an antidote for this kind of video, I'd recommend that uh, young people who might be troubled by some of these issues um, <clears throat> look to the internet, to a video by Matthew Vines, The Gay Debate, uh, The Bible and Homosexuality. He's an enlightened, young, gay Christian, Harvard-educated. I, I think the tough thing for me when things like this happen is um, that when someone speaks of punching a child, slapping their wrists. I, I think that, you know, every one of us who've been slapped recoil, mm -hmm. connected by uh, a collective unconscious recollection of those moments. And, uh, and that is really the ultimate injustice. So this week, 
I find in times like this I reflect and pray more. And so this week, I prayed for the young children of faith who stopped praying this week. Because they um, confuse abusive sanctimony with theology. <clears throat> because this is a kind of erosion of the soil, soul that occurs, that occurs slowly. When people like me, doctors, or other people of uh, perceived moral authority, or other kinds of authority, uh, with in fact actually variable amounts of wisdom, uh, make pronouncements. So I would just say to those kids that when you uh, stopped praying, I started. What do you hope would come out of this week we've had here in Fayetteville with all this controversy? Well, Well, of course, the best thing that could happen in the short run is that um, this would be um, a moment of reflection, um, that <clears throat> we would all realize the moral burden with which we encumber ourselves when we make these kinds of pronouncements, especially if they occur in the setting of what seems like theater. It's a good word, I hadn't thought of theater. <clears throat> and, and that there's a burden we carry for that. And I, here's the burden. I prayed for that, I prayed for that congregation of that minister. I prayed that they never de knelt as I did beside a coffin and prayed and, and, and cried until their face hurt and their stomach cramped and their knees were numb because someone they loved had put a bullet through their head. I pray that they are spared that. Because I can tell you then that no um, ego-driven flight of fancy or indulgence will bring that child back. The folks that persecute often lack that insight because it hasn't touched them personally. But how many times have we seen that change when it touches their children or their grandchildren or their friends? You know, the thing that I find hard to digest in the context of the church is the young men that persecuted Matthew Shepard decided on a fence instead of a cross best cross they had. So, <clears throat> I cannot get my brain around the moral persuasiveness of these forms. Um, one other thing, I'd say that part of what I found useful in this. Something I think we should reflect on, and certainly we should reflect on it before Tuesday, uh, in my view. But every day. Um, Fifty years ago, this country 
was affected by the scourge of Jim Crow laws. Here's the practical impact of those laws. There were some folks who, by a quirk of fate, were fair-skinned enough that they were seduced to, for the sake of real convenience, being able to eat at a restaurant or go to a bathroom or take a shortcut through a neighborhood or travel through a part of the country where access could be difficult, to engage in the erosion of their soul. For them, that was a kind of an insidious deal with the devil that we should not, never, as a country, have foisted upon them. And, and yet, what we ask these young people to do is the same thing. So I would appeal to people of faith, and particularly uh, to people of faith who have been victims of prejudice to reflect <coughs> on that so that we could come together uh, despite our differences. And one thing, and that is that we should never write into law that anyone is less equal than anyone else. Comments. Could you relate to what, some of what uh, Wayne just talked about? The year that I was born, I was legally considered the bastard child of my parents. Although they were legally, morally, and biblically married, it was not considered legal here in North Carolina or in 30 other states in the United States. I was born in 1964, and so for the first three years of my life, I was an illegitimate child. Not until 1967 when the U.S. Supreme Court made it legal for interracial couples to be married. Um, it was then at that point my parents were considered married. Um, growing up, I, I heard how I was an abomination of God, and that biracial children should have been put to death at birth. Uh, my mom would tell me about places that she couldn't take me, uh, places that she couldn't go with my father. There are movies that I've watched over the years of um, different things that went on during that time. and. Um, Honestly, it, it made me mad that my parents would even bring the child into the world at that time um, because it was un unsafe for them, let alone me. And it's 48 years later and the same arguments that people used against my parents, they're using against me. The same biblical scriptures they used to say that my parents shouldn't be married they use to say that I should not be with my fiance. To hear that, that what I feel for her is sick and morally wrong and sinful is, <coughs> is unreal. But I, I, I grew up knowing two things. I liked girls, and Jesus loved me. Those two things I knew without a shadow of a doubt. <coughs> I always knew that I wanted to go into the ministry in some way, but I was told I was going to hell, so, you know, 
if, you know, if, if I had to believe that God didn't love me, then why would he want to use me? And it looked like every time I turned around, that's exactly what he was doing. He was using me. Until I finally said, okay, I, I'm, I give in. I'm going to do what you want. Um, my life is not a sin. Yes, I'm a sinner. We all are. My life is not a sin. My, my love is not unnatural. There's nothing unnatural about it. Uh, I wasn't put on earth to procreate, although I do have three children and eight grandchildren. To also hear that mothers need to teach their daughters to walk like girls, dress like girls, and smell good. I didn't own a pair of pants until I started school. My mother kept me in dresses always. I can't wear cologne, I'm allergic to it unfortunately, but I still smell good. And all of those things are what attracted me to my girlfriend. So, um, I, I don't know what he, what he expects, or, you know. I'm fighting the same fight my parents fought and it's not fair. Um, it's not fair to me. It's not fair to anyone. It wasn't fair to them. Even before 1967, North Carolina tried to put an amendment in their constitution having one race marriages. It didn't win. It never passed. Um, so here again, they're trying to put hate into the Constitution. It's not going to win. People aren't going to let them do that. Tell me a little bit about your vision for yourself in the ministry. And I know I'll let the world in on it. You've been studying horticulture. <laughs> Are you going to be a uh, pastor of horticulture? Or? I started by saying that I'll pray to those plants that don't want to grow. And <laughs> so far it's working wonders for my tomatoes. Um, uh, to me they go hand in hand. Um, earth is nature. God is all around. It, it just goes together. Um, I actually see me using horticulture as a doorway into the ministry. Um, I've just recently been elected the first deacon of, of our church, Diversity and Faith, and um, I'll be the deacon for a year, and at that time they can choose to ordain me or not, and that's my goal. Um, I want people to know especially the LGBT community. God hasn't turned his back on any of us. Um, he wants us all to love each other. He wants us all to be loved. We're here to take care of each other, not, not hurt each other. We're not here to put someone down for their race, for, their, for whether or not they can walk or not, or who they love. That's not my God. My God doesn't do doesn't do hateful things to people. Uh, he, my God teaches love. Richard Flannery, right? Yes, sir. And um, so you said you grew up uh, Pentecostal. Yes. Well, I want you to know that it's unu it would be unusual, but it would be okay if you want to speak in tongues for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pass it right now. <laughs> Just if it hit, if the sphere hits you. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know much of your story, so maybe you can tell us a little bit. Yeah. Um, like I, uh, I told a couple people, I grew up in a uh, Pentecostal apostolic background. 
a very traditionalist. Um, at a very young age, I didn't notice that I had a same-sex attraction. Um, and I was okay with that. However, the forces that be that played a role in my life, especially the church, um, was not okay with that. So the sermon that you heard, or the clips we heard, was not uncommon to me. Honestly, I wasn't even shocked when he said it because I've heard it a million times before. Um, it's just now that um, the, these types of sermons have become more and more um, pointed um, in, the, in the midst of these political times where the LGBT community is fighting back and fighting for rights. The church is fighting hard, some churches rather, are fighting just as hard to push back the progress. So these types of sermons are not shocked. And so I would say I built up a tolerance to it over the years, up until about high school. And I started really seeing the fruits of men like that in speeches like that, fruits of that type of labor when I started going to school. Um, the bullying, the ridicule, uh, the harassment. Uh, frequently I would find things of mine stolen. Um, I had stuff thrown at me. I was threatened to be beaten on um, several occasions. It's probably one of the most hated people uh, amongst certain groups uh, at the school. Um, because I didn't walk like, or act like, or talk like, or fit this mold description. Just like he, uh, Pastor Harris, has uh, assigned to us all. And so, uh, the only way I really got through high school, um, mind you, I was also going to church at the same time. Didn't really find much comfort, shelter, understanding, answers there either. So really the only place I really could find um, the space to clear my head and really evaluate myself was at home, in my room, in my own privacy. Um, after I finally graduated high school and I thought it was over, then I went to college and found the same thing. So the same type of harassment, the hatred, that is perpetuated by these types of sermons, these types of ideas, I ran into once again. But something changed in college that I didn't, um, that I, or something changed in college that didn't happen in high school, or didn't change in high school, and I accepted myself for who I was, everything I was, everything I wasn't. Um, I took the what I call the bundle of the book, and I bought it wholesale. Um, in college, I, I I met LGBT people, LGBT friendly allies. And I started to get out in the network and understand that there was a community out there that was willing to help and to support um, people that were reaching out. And it's from that hand that someone extended to me that really was a big saving grace in my life. Um, graduated college, um, just uh, got a professional certification. I'm going back to school for another one. And so, you know. I'm doing things with my life that are productive, that I like to do. And one of the things um, that I decided to do was get involved. As someone extended a hand to me, so I wanted to uh, extend that hand to others and to be the change, the progress that's needed in this day and time. It's one thing just to sit and complain and, and go, oh my God, that's horrible that he said that. Um, but then there's a time to accept the fact that he said it but what are we going to say about it? What are we going to say back? How are we going to respond? Um, and so I decided that I was not going to be the victim of any more of these types of speeches. And I decided to put my energy and efforts and stop being the victim and being someone who helped to push the change. So I'm a member of the Fayetteville LGBT Alliance. Um, we're here to help support and provide advocacy um, to the LGBT community and our straight allies. And so that's really um, taking a uh, lemon and making lemonade. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you very much. I'm mindful of the time. Mm -hmm. Roberto Otto, you have a very special place here. You have been very kind. Tell us a little bit about what's on your mind. Well, 
many things are on my mind. It's hard to decide where to start. Um, I guess I will start by saying that I happen to be striped, happen to be married for 47 years to the same man, which don't let anybody ever tell you that marriage is without problems and without challenges. <laughs> they lie. <laughs> I will further say that I have been 30 years in the National, in the National Organization for Women, uh, Fayetteville National Organization for Women, and we have as one of our core principles to work for the rights of the LGBT community as well as many other things that we do. Uh, and furthermore, 30 years ago, I lived next door to one of the prominent people in that church that uh, preached the sermon, I mean, to the Berean. And uh, so their attitude is not strange to me. Uh, my children basically grew up with uh, some of them, and they even attended church as guests a few times. They managed to come out of it unscathed, I think. Um, and I would just say that so long as one of us is discriminated against, none of us are equal. And that's why I work on these issues. Um, I know I have friends who are gay, friends who are lesbian, and I don't see that they want anything different than anybody else, just to be treated like real people and allowed to live their lives as they want to live them. And I think they should be allowed to do that. And I really hate this business about the uh, amendment that's on the ballot on Tuesday. I, I, I think it's a, a terrible stain on North Carolina should we pass this. I just really do. So. And I have a friend who can't be here today, but she wanted me to say that she really wants to know what it is that women smell like or are supposed to smell like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we both had daughters and we're a real little confused. <laughs> wrap this up. Thanks to everybody who came and spoke so eloquently. And uh, if anybody is watching this on YouTube, I think you have had a chance to see some very valuable witness in a situation that's going to go on. This was sparked by an election that's set for the 8th of May. No matter what happens at that election, the issues that we've been talking about here today are still going to be in play. I'm hoping that this, this series of very eloquent witness can be constructive and useful in working some of those things out.